So tonight we're going to talk about, we, last week we talked about Calvinism versus um, um, Arianism, right? Not Arianism, but um, now I forgot the name. What's that? Arminianism. Arminianism. I always get caught up with Arminianism and many of them. <laughs> um, and we talked about that and... Um, we came to a conclusion somewhat, and we ran the list as to what were the, what where do we stand on? And um, pretty much everybody stood on the right side, as I call it, versus Calvinism. Now we're gonna I see- mean, I mean, but don't get me wrong, there were still some questions, you know, no, that- so Listen, no, no, no. One of them, each one of them has a standing somewhat, but as you know, as you add water to it, it evaporates. You know, you know what I'm saying? And especially Calvinism. Calvinism, whatever you attach water, you put water on, it it just dissipates. I hate to say it, but it's true. Um, and we're gonna see why. We we want to see why. Is it is it biblical? Is Calvinism biblical? And where did it come from? Where does this store come from? So we're going to delve deep into it tonight. We, after this, I think you're going to get a great understanding of where you stand and where Calvinism stands. You're going to see the historical account. You're going to see the, the historical account of where the fathers of the church, the early church, stood. You're going to be astounded by the, the, the scriptures that are used to confound this, I would say, it's, I would say error in the church. I would not say her heresy, please. Error in the church. And you're going to see where it came from. So with that, I'm going to open up to an article. Let's see. See if you guys can see it. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Let's start reading. So it says, let me move to the side here. Let me move you guys. There you go. Providence has tried to say that the doctrine of man's total inability is the historical position of the church, but that's simply not true. Many take for granted that the church has always held to the doctrine of total inability. Yet a study of history reveals that the doctrine of free, of free will was universally taught by the early church, without exception. For the first three to 400 years, the early church was continually defending the doctrine of free will and refuting, listen to this, refuting the Gnostics who hold to the doctrine of total inability and determinism or fatalism. And that basically means that we have no control with sinful beings and we truly do not control anything that happens because we're sinful beings. No free will, inability to reach out to God, an inability to to be uh, uh, to have a relationship with the Almighty. The Noxus had a predestination philosophy. You remember what predestination means, meaning that everything happens for a reason, and you have no absolutely no power over it, right? Which includes your free will. You have no control over it. If God wanted to use you for say to destroy you. For the glory, for the glory he has, then by all means, you're just part of God's showing his glory by destroying you. Right? That's basically what it means. And Nazis had the uh, predestination philosophy of fatalistic mentality of Kesara, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. But the early church believed that man's free choice had a major contribution, ultimate 
determination to his course and destiny. That means we have a part in what happens in our lives, like receiving God or not receiving God. So it's the consequences of, of choice, right? We have a consequence of choice. We receive God. We have we we receive God's blessing. He's eternity, uh, eternity and and resurrection, right? But the Gnostic says that your your flesh is evil, and wicked, and you have no course in this life. And the good thing, this pure Gnostic, the pure thing in you is the spirit that dwells in you. But everything else, it, it, it is it's disgusting, it's sinful, and you're just taking up time and matter. That's all it is. There are those today who make the doctrine of total inability an essential doctrine of the Christian faith and are quick to condemn anyone who would dare question or challenge. But in times of early Christianity, the doctrine of free will was considered orthodox. And the doctrine of total, orthodox meaning right. That's what means orthodox, meaning right, in rightness. In rightness. The doctrine of total inability was heretical. Being considered orthodox and heretical is merely a matter of dates. The early church said that only Gnostic denied the freedom of the will, yet many denominations of our day say that only heretics affirm it. Okay. So I'm going to go down... down to those early church leaders. And I want to show you that the Gnostics were around. What do you think the Gnostics were around? What what date, what time, how much uh, around uh, uh, before? Do they date? The time of Jesus, do they date after Jesus? Do they date a little bit after Jesus? I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking a few hundred years after Jesus. Okay. Maybe like three hundreds, four hundreds, you know, like around that time. What do you think, Frankie? I think it's earlier than that. No? It's earlier than that. Yes. Where? You're right. You're absolutely Possibly. Right. Okay, because the Nazis view that the flesh is a sinful substance, they deny that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And that is why the scriptures call them the Antichrist. In 1 John 4 3, 2 John 1 7. You want to read that for, for me, Frankie? First, okay. First John, not the gospel, first John, the epistle. Okay. Hold on. Let me get the oh jeez. First John four. First John, first John four three. Four three, got you. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, huh? L little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is, who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. All right. That's good. Uh, Mary, you want to read Second John? Of the epistle, one seven. Second John. Yes, yeah, Second John. Verse one through uh, uh, chapter one, verse seven. Okay. But many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. That's right. That's right. So uh, now, now you get an understanding that what John is talking about is, is not so much 
uh, the Antichrist, but those who proclaim that Jesus did not come in the flesh. These were Downisms or Downism. They were a, a form of Gnosticism, and they were trying to infiltrate the church. They're trying to, and their philosophies, they're trying to infiltrate the church. Now, let's go to the Gospel of John. Uh, yeah, the Gospel of John. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's going to get very, 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 very enjoyable to listen to this. I want you to read the whole, the first chapter, all of the first chapter. But any one of you guys. And I'll tell you when to stop. The whole first chapter. The whole first, the whole first chapter, till eighteen. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet, the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of, the, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory of the son, of the only son, from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, do you see an indication that John that continues with his narrative combating heresy? He combats heresy from the very beginning. He said, "This light, this light." And John was the was was the uh, it testifies of this light, but he's not the light of the world. But this one is the light of the world, and he became flesh. See how drastic Gnosticism has been around for a very long time. Gnosticism has been around for a very long time, and John was combating of it. The, the, there were the massive debates throughout Christian history to to at least, well, we're still debating. We're still debating Gnostics. We're still debating. There's still Gnostic uh, believers, and, and there's still there, there those who have Gnostic beliefs. I believe, I believe, and so many other scholars believe, that Calvinists are those Gnostics in the church. Am I saying they're heretics? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying they're constringent, right? They, 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 they see themselves, but don't see that they're other believers. And so it keeps them in a bubble. It keeps them in a very tight, tight bubble. I had a conversation with a brother who uh, started first groups of Sons of God. And he happened to be at the time a Calvinist. And and um, I just recently spoke to him, and he's no longer a Calvinist. He's going to church as Calvinist, but he despises them today. He despises them because they're very constringent. Um, he goes on to say harsher words than I would, would say. I would say that they're in error. I wouldn't say that they're heretic. I would say that they're in error. Um, and... 
they have a, a certain understanding. And what we're going to find out is that Gnostics have an understanding of total depravity, total inability. So it's total inability, total depravity. They're both of the same words. Both of the same words. And the church has been combating that since almost the beginning of, of, of the church, of the early church, of the Jewish church that have been combating this among their own people. So let's move on. Gnostics taught that man was sinful by nature, while the early church, church taught that man was sinful by choice. We would agree with that, right? We're sinful by choice. It was referring to these Nazi groups that John wrote that they went out from us, but they were not of us. And they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out and they might not be made manifest. They might, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us and we yeah but see here's the problem here's the problem with that statement it says gnostics taught that they were sinful by nature right and then the other one says by choice right but here's the problem with that when god created and we could go back to the beginning because obviously that's where everything begins right if you go back to the beginning now now listen to this before you get into that 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 the discussion there I'm going to point out something. What they're talking about is a willful, sinful transaction, or should I say transgression. It's different. We're all born yeah. in sin. Yeah, but check it out. Right? Check it yeah. out. When God made Adam, he's perfect. Yeah. So there is no sinful nature. Am I correct? That is correct. So, so, that, so there you can say there's a choice. There's nothing to taint it. There's nothing to get in the way. And, and, and you can at least say, and I think even amongst Calvinists, you can say that Adam had the free ability to choose because there was no sinful nature. But even in the sinful, even as a perfect human being, he made a choice to yeah. go yeah. bad. Yeah. How? How is that yeah. even possible if he he's not tainted? He's not... He doesn't have a sinful nature. Well, let, 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 let me give you a, another uh, another point. Satan was not. It, it's the same thing with that because I don't think happened, a lot so, of people. I don't think so, a lot of people discuss that the angels had free will to choose as well. So let me ask you a question. Then on on top of that, exactly. So they do have free will. That's one of the things that I I I was in discipleship. And I pressed one of the, the teachers that happened to be a minister at the time, because he all he was telling me was that uh, um, the angels, uh, uh, they're not allowed to, to, to sin. I said, well, if that's correct, I told him, if that's correct, the saints should have never sinned. But that's impossible. The, the scriptures show that one third of the angels rebelled. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but listen to this, even greater than that. So what's discussed here is, is not so much that we weren't born in sin and, and, and shaping iniquity, okay? All right, we're crooked. We're crooked. And we have the ability to sin. But what is what is getting down to is the free will. The free will. When God spoke to Cain, he told him, sin is crouching at your door. If you give into it, and I'm paraphrasing, then you will sin. What was he telling him? He was saying, you have the ability, you have free will, even after the fall, and I'm telling you that sin is scratching at the door and you can pull yourself back from it. Right? Isn't that, isn't that God giving him a warning? I mean, that was a warning. Yeah, he's giving him a warning, but he's telling him, you have free will. You can pull back. You cannot, you don't have to do it. I see that you're in turmoil. Yes, and, and, and it's a possibility that if you don't pull back, because you have the free will, right? Because God never took away free will. Would the Gnostics say, would the Covenant say that we our free wills have been taken away, free will to make a choice? Right? So that, 
is balanced out. Not yeah, some thought. But do you know why? Do you know why I think they they believe? I, I think I know why. Because it goes back to other scriptures that point out, like from predestination, that from before the foundation of the world type of stuff, that God already made a choice. Yeah, and, but the thing is, is this is this is why I always I always tell people, you do not know what whose choices are. How many people came out of, 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 of Egypt? Did all of Israel come out of Egypt? No. 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 They're, every, they're, they're, all, all, they're all of the people of God go into captivity? No. No. No, they didn't. There were Jews that stayed behind. They intermingled. They stayed. They took, they, they, uh, took care of grapes. They were underneath great uh, terror and tyrants. And they, they married. They married. They, they married, they kept their, 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 their traditions and understandings and, and, observe, and observance, and they stood in the land. So it was a remnant. There's always a remnant. But who's to say? You know, to say God's predestined and all man, and if you die, you die. It's to the glory of God. And if you live, you live to the glory of God. If you get hit with a Mack truck, it's to the glory of God. If you're drinking and you fall on your face and you happen to drown on your vomit, that's the will of the Lord. No, it's the will of the Lord. That's no, no, no. Your see, inability see, no. Of, of, that's your inability of free will to do what's right to keep you from harm's way. There's a big yeah. difference. That's, that's what the Gnostics, that's what the Calvinists talk about. They talk about you don't have the free will. You don't. You don't have. You could be saved if God, uh, irresistible grace, and all the common grace. It, it's just. It's just not biblical. It, it's just not biblical. Let's move on. Um. So in, in First John two nineteen, it says we can see that that teachers of the Gnostics were condemned in the scriptures. So already we have a a. a Information on these people. They're different name, different sex, but they believed in the same thing. They believed that the, 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 the flesh was corrupt. Uh, we had no free will. Uh, they, they believed in predestination. So already things are seeping in. They're seeping into to the minds of people in power. All right? On the other hand, in Philippians 4.3, Paul mentions my fellow laborers in the gospel, and his name Clement whose name he said was written in the book of life, history knows this man who was Paul's companion, who was endorsed by the scriptures, scriptures themselves as Clement of Rome. You ever want to write a book, you ever want to read anything, read on the Clement of Rome. Clement said, therefore, in the power of everyone, since man has been made possessed of free will, whether he shall hear us to life or the demons to destruction, Clement said that the free will was given because he who is good by his own choice is really good, but he who is made good by another on the necessity is not really good because he is not what he is by his own choice. Eight, Clement also said that the reason a sinner was susceptible to God's punishment for the disobedience was because a sinner has the ability to obey God. Is that true? Clement would have to be absolutely true. He has the ability to obey God, right? What are we here to when we witness to people? When we go out witnessing to people and telling them about the Lord, we ask them to come and obey God, right? Pray unto the Lord that you may be saved. That's, that's a call to obedience. What we do is what they've been doing for thousands of years, calling men to obedience. When when Peter stood before uh, uh, the, the actual uh, temple of the Lord, after the, the fall of the, the Holy Spirit, what did he do? He proclaimed the gospel, right? This man who knows Jesus who died on the cross, he is God. And, and he's, he's yeah, but the Calvinist, the Calvinist would say that that was the work of the Holy Spirit, drawing drawing the individual yeah, and but you so see, that's the difference between evangelicalism 
and Calvinism. Calvinism can't go out and just preach, right? Because it has to be done in the work of the Holy Spirit, irresistible grace. You have to be known that you are the elect. That's bogus. That's not biblical. We're going to look into it more deeply. So let's go on. So Clement said that the free will is given because he who is good by his own choice is really good, but he who is made good by another on the necessity is not really good because he is not what he is by his own choice. Clement also said that the reason the sinner was susceptible to God's punishment for the disobedience was because the sinner has the ability to obey God. He said, for no other reason does God punish the sinner, either in the present or in the future world, except because he knows that the sinner was able to conquer but neglect to gain the victory. The reason that a sinner is punishable for sinning, he said, is because a sinner is able not to sin. He said that a sinner is punished, not for inability, but for his negligence. I, I wholeheartedly agree with Clement. Now, Nexus, Nexus was another figure in the early church, and he was a disciple of Apostle John. Same John we were talking about. It was modern in the Roman Colosseum by being eaten by lions. In contradiction to anoxicism, Ignatius taught that men were sinners not by nature, but by choice. Ignatius said, if anyone is truly religious, he is a man of God. But if he's irreligious, he's a man of the devil, made such not by the nature, but by his own choice. Ignatius also said, they is set before us life upon our observance of God's precepts, but death as a result of disobedience. And everyone, according to the choice he makes, shall go to his own place, let us flee from death, and make choice of life. Valuable words by Ignatius, who was a disciple of John. And of course, and of course the culmination of that which reaffirms it is it, it says that at the end, right, that the, that God is going to call the resurrection, right, um, um, the great right throne right. judgment. Is yeah. it the great right throne judgment? I believe that so. White right throne judgment, everyone is going to be judged. Everybody's right? going to be judged. And you know no that matter, God is listen, be, no, matter, no matter where you're at. So um, if, if you happen to be growing in from the time of your death to to the time of judgment, you're going to be dwelling in hell to that time. God's going to take you up, resurrect you, and judge you forever and put you in the lake of fire. You know, so. But he, but God is going to be fair, is he yeah. not? And that means. He's going to be just. How, he's going to be how, how, He's not going to be fair. Be fair. Yeah, okay, he's going fair, to, he's fair going to be just. Man do. Fair is what man does. Just. just is what God does. Yeah, he's going to be just. Yes. In other words, you know, a lot of people, like today, we might call that being fair, but what it is, is just. So he's going to, he's going to, he's going to say, okay, I'm not just going to throw you in hell or, or throw you into the lake of fire just because, right? Yeah. He's going to say, I'm throwing you into the lake of fire because. Let's you know, take it's, a look it's, at it's like when someone's taken um, before the court, he's going to be sentenced, right? They read him the reason why he's dying. They read to him all of his all of his acts that caused him this punishment. And then they execute him. Yes. And that's basically what God does at the end. Yeah, he's gonna have his angels speak to them. And, and, tell and them, if I'm not wrong, there's gonna be witnesses, right? That's gonna yeah, witness and everybody. You know, I if I'm not mistaken, I think the saints, but I could be wrong. Um yeah, the saints will be there take because place. Because the rapture would happen, you know, first before the great white throne judgment. Yeah. And so, yes, we are going to be, the, you know, all the saved or the elect is going to be there already. And then when that happens, there's going to be witnesses. There's angels are going to be there, too. There's going to be. Oh, absolutely. They're going to be. They're going to yeah. be. They're going to be filling out the the uh, the book of life forms. The book yeah. of Acts one is going to be filling out for you. So, so that means good. whoever whoever's being thrown into the lake of fire, they're going to know before they're thrown that. Well, I mean, it's pretty much a, a given if you're in hell already. So, 
It's just a matter of judgment, full judgment, and nothing but the judgment. Yeah, so, but even in that, even in that, God is being just in that He's saying, "I'm not just going to throw you in hell. We're going to have a we're going to have a trial. We're going to have a, a fair trial that's going to show how you have fallen short and 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 your resistance. How many times? I'm pretty sure that God is going to show how many times." He offered and, and 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 gave the chance to be saved, and they refused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 I think that if a person was forced, right, that they would have a case. No, no. Right, I, I'm just saying, if I was if I was forced, yeah, wouldn't I have a case? Forced wouldn't to I what? say, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you forced me to not listen. What? I'm saying that if a person was forced to, you know, to make a choice, right, to say, oh, but I couldn't come to the Lord because I, I was unable to. This is what we're talking about, inability, right? No, inability. no. In, 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 inability means that, well, inability, I mean, inability means uh, that you are not able uh, by your own will, that man has no will, and only God could draw his spirit to you and bring you to know him and have relationship with him. Exactly. And so the I would have a case. talks about how the, the spirit of God comes and, and you is irresistible as it says, and you have no choice in the matter to come there to There you him. go. But if I was forced or if I didn't have the ability, I would have a case to say, hey, wait a minute. You won't have a case anyways before a, a judge God anyways. It's, it's not happening. That that might happen in, in that might happen in New York, but it ain't happening in the course of, of the Lord. So let's move on. So the apostle John also had a disciple called name, excuse me, Polycarp. Polycarp was a bishop of Church of Smyrna. And when Revelation was written, the church of Smyrna was one of the only churches in Revelation which Jesus did not say anything negative against. Revelations two point, uh, uh, two point. Revelations uh, chapter two verses eight through uh, eleven. Polycarp was a personal friend of Ignatius, and he too was also sent to the Colosseum where his martyrs and Ignatius was. Polycarp had a faithful disciple named Irenaeus. Irenaeus refuted the Gnostics by saying men are possessed with free will and endowed with the faculties of making a choice. It, it is not true, therefore, that some are by nature good and others bad. He also said man is endowed with the faculties of distinguish, distinguishing good and evil, so that without compulsion he has a power by his own will and choice to perform God's commandments. 13. And man is possessed of free will from the beginning, God is possessed of free will in whom likeness man was created. And he said, this expression, how often would have gathered thy children together, thou would have not set forth the ancient law of human liberty, because God made man a free agent from the beginning, possessing his own soul to obey the behest of God voluntarily and not by the compulsion of God. So God leaves his hands out. He sends his son. He gives position for, for with his blood so that man can have relationship with God. Have the ability, not the disability, but the ability to have relationship with God. And we as human beings have what? And we always have had free will. Free will. We have always had free will. Justin Martyr was an early evangelist and apologist for the Christian faith. He labored tirelessly for the Lord until he too was martyred in Rome. He said, we have learned from the prophets, we hold it to be true, that punishment, chastisement, and rewards are rendered according to the merit of each man's action. Otherwise, if all things happen by faith, faith, then nothing is of our own power. For it is predestined that one man be good and another man evil. Then the first is not deserving of praise, and the other is to be blamed, unless humans have the power of avoiding evil, choosing good, by true choice, they are, have not accountable for their actions, whatever they may be, for neither would be man 
be worthy of praise if he did not himself choose the good, but was merely created for that end. This man is speaking hundreds, close to a thousand years, right? Hundreds of years in Augustine, before Augustine, and at least a hundred years before Augustine, and, and hundreds of years before Calvin. And they're fighting Gnostics who say, you don't have free will. Whatever happens, happens. Kesara, sera. But these men, Ignatius, Polycarp. Yeah, but where are they getting their thoughts from? Are they getting their thoughts, obviously, from the scriptures? The scriptures. The absolutely scriptures? the scriptures. Okay. Absolutely the scriptures. Absolutely. Yeah. One of my heroes is Tertullian. Tertullian was the, the, the first Western... Theologian, he came up with the concept of the Trinity. The first one. Tertullian writes, was another leader of the early church. He was a Christian apologist and is known for his prolific writings. He was in perfect agreement with early Christianity when he said, no reward can be justly bestowed, no punishment can be justly inflicted, inflicted upon whom he is good or bad by the necessity and not by his own choice. Let me read that again. He was a Christian apologist known for his prolific writings. He was in perfect agreement with early Christianity when he said, no reward can be justly bestowed. No punishment can be justly inflicted, inflicted upon him who is good or bad by necessity and not by his own choice. Matodias. Matodias was a Christian martyr who lived near the end of the third century. He wrote, those pagans who decide that man does not have free will, but say that he is governed by the unavoidable necessities of fate, are guilty of empathy towards God himself, making out to be the cause and author of human evils. He said the divine being is not by nature implicated in evils. Therefore, our birth is not the cause of these things. He went on to say that men are possessing free will and not by natural na uh, natural evil. He said there is nothing evil by nature, but it is by the use that evil things become such. So I say that he, that man, was made with free will and not as if there were already evil in existence. No, I, I agree with that because... When we look at the beginning, and it, it 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 doesn't start with man, it doesn't start with Adam. It actually starts with the angels because that happened first. He gives the angels free will, right? And yeah. then there's rebellion, and that rebellion was by choice, right? Yeah. I, I don't think anybody could disagree with that. That was by choice, and we you know we talked about the Nephilims, we talked about yeah. the we talked about the principalities, we talked yeah. about all those. Those things. Now, see, here's here's where man might try to say, well, it's God's fault, because since God knows all things and he allows it to take place, is he therefore responsible? Mm -hmm. You understand? Because it's like if you know something bad, like let's say we was able to look into the future, which God can do. God can yeah. see the future. Right. And if you knew that someone was going to get hit by a car and you knew you could stop it, but you didn't, does that make you responsible? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So so that's how I, I, I guess that, that people might try to say, well, then it's God's fault. But God is not directly responsible. He creates the creature perfect, but it's the creature that makes the choice to rebel. Yeah. And so the, it, therefore God is not responsible because he gives the opportunity he like you said he's given the creature the opportunity because remember it's not just man but also the angels that he's giving this opportunity to to the difference i think between angels and man is that he doesn't give the angels another opportunity whereas with right. man he gives us a a another opportunity after the fall to still right. have the the ability to be saved yeah 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 so let me let me let me put this video on guys hold on a minute let me just uh 
share the screen here. All right, let me move this over here. Can you see the screen, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me put this on. Cause this division. These are very important questions that few seem to consider, yet the answer in history is obvious enough. It was not until the fourth century that Gnostic and Manichaean doctrine began to influence the church. Augustine, after saturating himself in Gnostic philosophy for nearly a decade, was converted to the church and as he was appointed as a bishop. Augustine, once he was in the church, began to contradict what the fathers had always taught about free will, and he taught views that were in accordance with the Gnostic doctrines. And it was under Augustine's influence that the church began to embrace the doctrine of the natural inability of man. Now, it is an undisputed and known fact of history that Augustine was influenced by Gnosticism and was a member of Manichaeanism. In fact, this is a point committed by, by philosophers and admirers. John K. Ryan, in his introduction to the Confessions of St. Augustine's, caused this division. These are very important questions. So that's just a clip. That's what I like to do. I like getting just clips. And that way you're able to see in, in a small amount of time what transpired um, and how to influence. How to influence? How did how did it go from hundreds of years, Augustine, who by the way, the church, the Catholic Church, uh had nothing to do with him when when he heard her, his his uh, heretical thoughts and things like that. Because he didn't start off all bad, right? He followed along with the free will, and but he was so influenced by those who hung, who he hung, hung out with that um sooner or later it just came out of him. So sad. So let's move on to the other one. Uh, Lutheran columns restored. On the two major uh, people of the Reformation, John Calvin and Martin Luther. John Calvin wrote several volumes of what he calls his Institutes, and he devoted it to the King of France. And the point of devoting it to the king of France is he wanted the king of France to try to believe that the reformers were the true Christians. And to try to demonstrate that, Calvin quotes Augustine over a hundred times to try to demonstrate to the king of France that these reformers are not breakaways, but they're going back to the original, back to true Christianity. But Calvin went back to late Augustine when he denied free will. He went back to late Augustine that said everything is predestined by God rather than to the earlier Christian Augustine who said man has free will and is responsible. So John Calvin was greatly influenced by Augustine and passed that influence on in his books called The Inst on the Two Major uh, People. So you're getting, uh, you're getting uh, uh, a background or where Calvin got the stuff. Now, Augustine was was not kicked out of the church, but he was he was shunned. He was shunned. Um, and, and not to say that all that Augustine wrote was a bad thing. No, uh, on the contrary, he wrote uh, great things: the city, the city of God, uh, his confessions. You got to read those things. But what happens is that he did not shun or he did not tear away uh, the teachings that he had prior, and it crept up. You know, it's like if someone converts to Christianity and all of a sudden years come by later and um, he's a teacher, he's a discipleship teacher, and he's implementing little bits and little bits into his lessons about uh, the oneness of, of Islam, uh, Allah, uh, Muhammad. So what happened was that he integrated all these, these philosophies into the church. 
and gradually those who have been uh, um, announcing free will recognized that he had changed. Now, mind you, I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to because I, I hear the word Gnostic, but I'm going to have to look look up what is a Gnostic and, and where did they come from and, and, and what is that, you know, because I don't I've heard of it before, but I don't really know what a Gnostic is exactly. Yeah, well, um, yeah. and and you know, and that's interesting because if if Augustine was a Gnostic and Calvin was believed in Augustine, he he, he was a Gnostic. He had certain beliefs. Understand? It's like Jehovah's Witnesses are not Arians. Arians is the the actual uh, actual uh, doctrine that was followed in the early Catholic Church, which they did not believe Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, or would say that he was a man, but he did not possess the endowment and power of God. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. And Arianism spread, and, and it spread for a couple of hundreds of years until it was, was, was quenched and, and was able to uh, through great scholars uh, 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 fill the ranks with orthodoxy. Understand? And so Arianism, um, did it go away? Absolutely not. Because you got your own witnesses today that deny the, the, the deity of Christ. Oh, he's like God. You know, he's, 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 you know, he's like light God. You know what I mean? He's, he's like God. He's not the God, but he's a God, you know? So these are things, if you see things now, these heresies or these errors, these are things that have existed for a very long time. Yeah. You know, it's like they say, any, any a rose by any other name is still a rose. Uh -huh. it's, it's still the same. It's still the same lie. So it's the same way with them. So let's move, let's move on. So let's see, maybe I did I put this on. Uh, I think I did. I'm not sure. Let's see. But is Gnostic is Gnostic a New Testament thing, or was that something oh, that was, was in New the Testament. Old Testament? John fought it's with New John fought what was called Darwinism. Darwinism was a form of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is like the whole name. But he had certain sects. You had the Malachians, you Dallasists, you had the many, many sects. But he's believed in the same thing. They believed that the flesh was, was wicked and evil and had no part with, with God, only the spirit. Uh, they believed in eating vegetables only, uh, abstaining from sexual uh, interaction, never marrying. You, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, the Calvinists took that one out. <laughs> they, took, they took that one out because it would have it would have diminished their their rank. So they took that one out. Uh, and not to say they were they they have under certain under, uh, certain things about uh, Calvinism that is strikingly the same as Gnosticism. So let's move on. See, we'll see right there. So John Cavill is greatly influenced by Augustine and passed that influence on in his books called The Institutes. Martin Luther was greatly influenced by Augustine. Luther was a monk of the Augustinian order. So he was taught what Augustine had taught and been passed down through the order of the Augustinian monks. Uh, Martin Luther later in his life wrote a book called um, The Bondage of the Will. And in there, he asserts that man does not have free will. Man has a will like a, a horse. And whoever sits in the saddle controls the horse. So if God is sitting in the saddle or the will of a man, then man will do what God commands him to and will obey because God is controlling his will. But if Satan is sitting in, quote, the will of man, then Satan will control his will but man has no control over his own will. 
So Augustine, so John Calvin was greatly influenced by Augustine and passed that influence on. All right. So I'm going to put this one on second agreement between Calvinism and Agnosticism. Right. Not to say they believed in Agnosticism. I, I, you know, there's peppered and salted certain things that they picked up through Augustine. Right. Augustine was an influence influencer of Luther and Calvin. And Luther and Calvin believe in Augustinian understanding of doctrine, which is to me, I love I, I, I love Luther and I love what he did for the church. But in the same in the same turn, um it wasn't complete. He he came to an understanding Augustinian doctrine and he implemented in the church. But it's like anything, right? You, you're building something, you, you see something, and you tweak it, you, you take that stone out, you put the stone in, and you, you make it. Well, that's what the church has been. And it's been like that for 2,000 plus years. We're tweaking it constantly. You know, we have uh, uh, Baptists, uh, Presbyterian, uh, Evangelicals, we have Pentecostals. Pentecostals are laid on the block, by the way. We only been around since the turn of the century, by the way. We're only about 100 years old, maybe less. You mean it doesn't come from the day of Pentecost? <laughs> well, we would love to say that, but no, it actually started in Hazusa Street in California. <laughs> so, and that was uh, the late part of the 18th century. So, I mean, the uh, 19th century, if I'm not mistaken, 20th century. And um, so, there were charismatic movements, but that in particular is the one who set Pentecostalism uh, in its path. And so anyways, let's, let's get back. Uh, so we have, uh, let's see, let me move this over. Let's see. So this means this uh, similar understanding between Calvinists and, let's see. All right. Salvation that would come to them would come through knowledge and not through faith. So you're saved by knowledge, not faith. You see that? So it's not, and this is what, you know, I don't think it's part of Calvinism. I just feel that, um, yeah, and I'm going to give you the, the sandwich. I'm going to give you everything in the sandwich. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to need the cheese out and just leave the, the, the ham. I'm going to give you the whole sandwich. So here's what I'm talking to you about that there are things that differ with Nazism and Augustinism and Calvinism, but that there are some things that they do agree with. And they believe that this knowledge would be given to you in order for you to have this salvation so that you, when you died, would you go back up to the uh, disembodied state in heaven uh, and you had no choice whether to... Re you hear that? It, it sounds like irresistible grace, doesn't it? It sounds like the Spirit of God chases you, finds you, rustles you, and you have no choice because you know why? You got no free will. Now, I was talking to a person that me and Frank know that were in the first group, and he happens to, uh, he's coming out of the Calvinistic background, and he was literally ready to curse. Because he's so angry, so upset that he wasted so much time in, in that sort of church that he said he said to me, uh, and I sent him a couple of these clips in, which he loved, and he said that um, that um, what does that he say specifically? That they they're in error, and we and I sent him a couple of clips on Augustinian, and he already read it, he already understood, so. I was on the right track of getting the information I needed. And, and he said that, uh, you know, it's just a big lie. It's just a big lie. Because it, it, what it does, it ties you up. Because if you want to talk to, let's say, if you want to uh, witness to somebody. Now, they're great debaters. These people are great. Most debaters I know are communists. But they, 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 I never heard them evangelize. 
Well, if you believe, if you believe that it's the spirit that does everything, and we we I hear that all the time, right? That we don't do, we don't have to convince anybody. It's God that does the convincing, right? The one that but touches see, the heart. But th but this is what we learn, right? From the group, we learn from the very beginning. That is a partnership. Now, does God have to have you? No, he doesn't have to have you. He didn't have to have a garden. He didn't have to have Adam. He didn't have to have Eve. But he desired to have partnership, to have fellowship with you. That's what he wanted to do. And I, and I, I think even Calvinists would agree with that statement. I, I, absolutely. But what, what, how do you get there differs biblically? Biblically, because this, 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 this thing, for instance, Jonah, right? Uh -huh. He went to a people who were not a people, who were not the elect, excuse me, they were not the elect, right? And he went to Nineveh, and he went there. He didn't want to go there. In fact, the man almost drowned because he didn't want to go there. They were sinful and wicked and disgusting people that did disgusting practices, right? Day and night, they had temple prostitutes and the deplorable things. But God said when he wanted to go, he wanted to go back to, he wanted to go to his own people. He said, no, I'm going to send you to Nineveh. Nineveh? Yeah, see, oh, God... Kidding? T Tony, God is sovereign. Yeah, God is, and He does what He, what He wants, basically. He wants it done. He, yeah, and uh, we, we're, we're we're obligated to obey His command, yeah. and um, but even in that, we have free will to obey but, or not to obey. But let me tell you, God, when God, when God say, He puts you to a a, a Put you to uh, like a, like Jonah. He he dragged them, he dragged them, and and he 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 was in there for three days. And God had to humble him. He had to humble yeah. him and brought him. And and let me tell you, it was just you know pure miracle. It was what, a pure what, miracle. But the thing is, is that. I, listen, I don't yeah. think it's a miracle. I think if you spent three days in the well, you would be convinced too. <laughs> I mean, come on. No, it's a miracle that the fish didn't, uh, you know. You would change your mind too. And, and Andrew, but but what, it, what I'm getting down to is this. Yeah. The God went to people who were not elect. That's right. Who were not God's people. That's right. right? And he went. To God for saying, but do you think that was for any reason that other than God want to show himself up? W what is it? I is, there, is there something that God was showing us? I think God was showing us. I choose who I want to choose. But, but, there's always a but, right? But you have a choice to accept it or not. And, you know, and, it's, and, it's like and you know what's funny? You know what's funny that you use Nineveh because in that particular case and in that particular moment, they did repent. Yeah. And they did. All right? Now, they, did they, have, they could have just stayed in the way they were and you will never heard of Nineveh, Nineveh again. But the thing is that they repented. And I think that God was showing an example of him going and people out of their free will accepting. I think it's a big, big sign. It's a big, big sign. Yeah. So let me let me move on with this. Receive the knowledge or not, it would just be given to you. And that's how you knew that you had salvation because you had this special knowledge that nobody could teach you. You couldn't teach it to somebody else. But if you had it, you had it and you knew it. And that's how you knew you were one of, quote, the elect in their in their terminology. So that was Gnosticism. And in the view of regarding free will, Gnostics taught that man does not have a free will. It's a fatalistic situation in which there's heaven. And fatalism means that 
it is not in your hands. Anything can happen at any time. And you, you had no free will. That means you were subject to the elements. You were subject to whatever happened. Uh, fate. You know, I hate when people start talking about, you know, it's the fate. You know, it's, it's, it's going to happen. To, you know, it's, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. No, I don't believe that. I believe, yes, yeah, sure. Because we're sinful beings, and yes, our, our bodies are corrupted, and our bodies corrupt, and we're we're subject to the elements and time and space and and whatever else and sicknesses and things like that. And those things happen. And those are the things that we have no control of. But we what we do have control of is making decisions in our lives. The greatest decision in our lives is to give our lives to Christ. All right, here's one interesting question. What about babies, children that don't really have that, you know, understanding to okay. make a choice? Okay. But we know that children die. Yeah. Sometimes infants, right? Yeah, they do. How does that how does how does the free will work with that type of situation? Well, the free will is that that child is being taken care of by someone. No, the free will no. of the person who's responsible for that baby is the free will at that moment in time. That's evident. And if that baby happens to die because the person, the kid has, gets sick, he has, you know, whatever, and he dies of it, well, then he dies of it. We, we live in a sinful world. We, die, we live in a, a, a place that people get sick. We have diseases. We have... Uh, uh, all, all things that go on. Yeah, but I'm talking about the ultimate fate of that soul, right? The well, ultimate fate on. of that you soul. Know, God, God is a, a, a righteous God. And he's not to impute uh, uh, eternal damnation on a child. Uh, by the way, that's the reason why Roman Catholicism um, um, baptized babies due to the fact that they felt there was uh, that their child without baptism will do that that baby to to death. Now you know wait, we're talking about prehistoric Christianity, and there are some churches that believe that way, especially when they drew away from Jewish Christianity or Messianic Christianity. And I I know that we as Christians, right? We don't believe in baptizing babies, right? We no, we, we don't. usually baptize no. later. No. As Protestants, no, no, because we believe that a person has to confess their sins, give their lives to Christ, and then they'll be baptized. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. Right? We present them. We, pre we they present it. Like they present it. Um, uh, you know, dedicated. Uh, that's a very biblical, very Judaic uh, Judaic? practice of, yeah. of of dedicating the child to the Lord. I had my, a couple of weeks back, I had uh, th three of my grandchildren dedicated before the Lord. Um, so, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean they don't have to get baptized later on. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, now listen to this. You get baptized out of your free will. Understand? And, and that's no knock towards uh, the Catholics. They believe that way. It's fine, no problem. But uh, my understanding of Scripture is that you're baptized when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because you can make a free decision on your own. You understand? Big difference. Yes. Uh, let's see. I think I played all the videos that I'm going to play. I think we're done with that. I think that let us read on some scriptures. These are scriptures that. Uh, and, 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 and before, and I don't know if you, you can answer this. Maybe you could find a video for me later on. Right. Um, Dick and Tony. Yeah. Um, but there is one scripture I, I actually, it's a, it's the story of Jacob and Esau, and the, how God made a sovereign choice yeah. while they were still in the womb. Now, and that also is a, a scripture I'm pretty sure that Calvinists use well, to say, hey, that God made a decision 
from before and where's the free choice when you're an infant in the womb? So, you know, like that's something that- Well, you, you know, got to take consideration of, of what took place. Now, why don't we read that scripture? That's in, obviously, well, in Genesis. There, well, there, there's the actual account. And then in Romans 9, it talks about, it mentions them again. And I think Romans 9 would be the better one because it kind of touches on the the whole, you know, like kind of right, so like predestination. You find but, this scripture. Is it Romans Romans 9, is that correct? Yes. And and, and it's interesting, you know, because it, because if you read it without, you know, without a proper understanding, you might come out with a certain belief that, hey, God made a choice. I mean, God made a sovereign choice, and that's it. Got to take it. All right, find the scripture for me. Um, it's Romans chapter nine. Okay, here goes. Uh, I think it's twelve. Let's see. Uh, Thirteen. Okay, Rebecca had conceived children. This is uh ten, nine ten, uh Romans nine ten, and it says, and not only so. Uh, yeah, you're right. Not only. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because or works, but because him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As is written, Jacob I've loved, but Esau I hated. Now, why did he hate Esau? <laughs> See, but that's interesting because it, that, that's remember what that that's interesting, yes. But why it's interesting? He, why did he hate Esau? Let's think about it. Why did he hate Esau? I don't know because if the, if if it's right, so let's go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis. I'm gonna yeah. tell exactly why he hated Esau. And of course that's, it's just Again, this is free choice. This is free. This is free will. So where are we in Genesis? Uh, I'm going to find. When I find out, I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Uh, it's Joseph. 19? Uh, 19, uh, 2519? Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. All right. When did uh, Jacob, you're talking about Jacob and Esau, right? Yes. Uh, I'm going to show you. Do, 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 do. Jacob. Wow. All right. All right. So let's see. It's the chapter 25, 19. 25, Yeah, yeah, look at that. Okay, now we have the birth of Esau and mm -hmm. Jacob. Mm -hmm. All right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Take it easy there. Two nations are, are in your womb, and two people for women you shall be divided, and one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve. The younger. It says two nations. Two nations. Right? Two nations. Those within uh, you, two people. What, what is indicating is that one will serve the younger. The older should serve the younger. But two nations. That's first thing. Then let's move down to uh verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking stew. Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Edom meaning red. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. And Esau said, I am about to die. 
of what use is my birthright to me? Jacob says, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he hid the drink and rose and went his way. So Esau despised his birthright. Yes. So Esau I have hated, and Jacob I have loved. That's yep. why. That's why. Yeah, see, but that suggests that, see, and this is where it gets interesting. Because that means that God is looking into the future. He is looking to the future. And now you found out the reason why he looked in the future and saw that he saw, but he, he saw he didn't hate until now. He hated them because he made a free choice, just like Cain, and he hated Cain. And with his hate, he put a mark on him. But see, you just hit it. I, that's the main reason why you have a divide. Because since you, you read Romans 9 and you're hearing a, of God making a choice before that even happens. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. God is looking into the future, which God does all the time. We, right. You know how God predicted or about the, 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 the Messiah, right? He's talking about the future. We live that way now. The return of Christ is a futuristic is a futuristic thing. That, that That's something that God is always doing. He sees into what we can't see. We can't see the future. He can. And, and not to say and, that God doesn't reveal it. I mean, if we look at Isaiah 4, 46, 10, you would see that he says, I, I, I know the beginning from the end. Now, uh -huh. reveals it is one thing. Now, he reveals those things to the pro his prophets. In some indications, sometimes he will say from the very beginning. Okay? But the reason why he hated Esau was because he don't, he so despised his birthright. Now, if 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 Isaac would have blessed Esau, he would have been the second and the, the third in the tier, the third in the tier of the fathers of the people of Israel. But because he didn't, he wasn't. His name is not mentioned. Not that, 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 that's why you see, but that's why I think that's where it gets interesting, because when you start talking about the future, it, that's where things get all kind of like, I don't agree. And and you get a divide because some people say, yeah, but the not, scriptures, not much, you know, not, yeah, but not yeah. much divide. Not not when, when you when you're talking about the things that God yeah. says that he speaks to his prophets. Remember. Uh, uh, sixty-five percent of the things that God spoke have come to pass. We're just waiting for the last what twenty something, uh, forty percent transpired, and the stuff that's not fulfilled is very violent. It's extremely violent. But there's some things. There's some times when God will speak, and He will speak on that very same day or the very same, uh, you know, time, that generation. And you'll find out exactly. But that's why he had Esau. How can you not hit a man who hates his, his birthright? Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And and you know what? I don't even think that word hate is properly translated because I don't think God hates anyone. But and in the Hebrew it would probably be the word ra. And ra means hate or despise. So you could do you could use despise. Despise sounds just as bad. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's not like it's not like myself, right? My father didn't even leave me a chuleta. <laughs> I, I didn't even have a chuleta to despise. You, you, you know what I'm saying? So uh we talk about Esau, when we talk about Esau despising his birthright, he left a massive amount of land. A land that will hold a nation, a land that will hold flocks of sheep and goats. You know, and he despised it. That's why he hated him. You know? Yeah. So, uh, let's read some scripture. I'm down to read some scripture. Um, and I'm not, we're not going to, obviously, we're not going to get through this. Let's, uh, let's see. Uh, Frankie, you want to read Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 6? Six. Genesis chapter 6. So you're right. Yeah. There's that chapter again. It is here. 
All right, chap, uh, chapter six, what verse again? Uh, verse five through six. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and they, in, in their intentions of their thoughts, of, of his heart, was only evil continuously. The Lord regret that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out men whom I have created from the face of the land, from the face of the land, man and animal and creepy things, birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I made them. But Noah, oh. mm -hmm. but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, if anything screens free will, freedom of free, freedom, you're able to express that you're able to go to your God is Noah. Every man on earth, every man, every man was doing evil in the sight of the Lord. But, but, but Noah, through his free will, had good standing with the Lord. Can't say any better than that, right? Let's go on to Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31. Uh, say again, where is that? Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31. You want me to get it? Thirty-one. It says, yeah, it says, and and they have built the high places of Topheth, which mm -hmm. is in the valley of the son of him. Oh, yeah, well, why don't you read from the beginning? Read from uh, verse thirty. Okay, for the sons of Judah have done evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house that is called by my name to defile it. And they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. Go ahead. They Continue? Yeah, go ahead. Therefore... Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no more be called Topheth or the valley of the son of Hemnam, but the valley of slaughter, for they will bury in Topheth, because there is no room elsewhere. And the dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth, and none will frighten them away. And I will silence in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, the voice of mirth and the voices of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall become a waste. Yeah. Okay, stop. So again, these are the choices that men do. They knew that that was the, the altar of the Lord, and they were sacrificing their children on the altars of the Lord. Mm. They knew better. They had free will, but they did it anyways. They had free will. They knew that what we were doing was wrong, and they did it anyways. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah, but you know what I find? Who was doing this? Was it the? Was it his people for the sons it was of his people, Judah. the tribe of Judah? Yeah, he's. Oh my God. The tribe of Judah. So this, so this wasn't Gentiles. No. Oh. 
does he speak in the Old Testament? Very slightly does he speak to. He speaks against them. He causes judgment on on those who are in power and on the nations. Uh, when yeah, so they definitely knew better. No, does no absolutely, absolutely. And what did they do? They had free will, and it did was according to their own eyes. Right? They sinned against the Lord, and they knew exactly what they were doing. Let's move on to Isaiah 41, chapter 41, verse 8. What is it? I'm sorry. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8. <laughs> Hold on, you know what? Hold on, hold on to that. Hold on. Okay. Chapter 41, uh -huh. 41 verse 8. Verse 8, right? Yes, verse 8. Yep. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest. For, furthest corners saying saying to you you are my servant i have chosen you and not cast you off fear oh. not yeah. fear not for i am with you do not be dismayed for i am your god i will strengthen you i will help you i will uphold you with my righteous right hand stop so you choice, you you chosen. We've never said that they have not. They chose, but Abraham also made the choice to follow God. Right when the scripture says that God called unto Abraham, what did Abraham do? God, he followed him. He went from the land with his ancestors to the land that God called him to. There's a choice. It's like yeah, yeah. Practice, right? Yeah, I, I and I it. and I agree. I definitely agree. There's no doubt about it because we 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 we're making a decision as well. Yeah. But this is where I think some people get twisted and they see that the word chosen, that because God chose you, then that automatically eliminates free choice. You know, like God is making like, uh, you know, like they say, irresistible grace. Yes. So I, I, I see, I understand, and I see what a Calvinist is seeing. Yeah. You understand? And I can, I can understand, but there's something that they're not seeing when it comes to the, to the other side of it, which right. is the free will, which is the free will, which you have to wrestle with that question. You have to wrestle with that question. Because if the, if free will is not involved, right? Yeah. Then then basically what you're saying is God is forcing Himself on you. Exactly. Exactly. So it's not irresistible grace. It is a, a partnership. He called yeah, Abraham. I, and, I get. And, I, yeah. Yeah, and Abraham said yes, Lord, and he follows him. So let's move on to um, uh, Deuteronomy chapter thirty. Verse 19. Got it. You have that, Frankie? Yeah. Uh, chapter what? Chapter Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 19. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Got it. Got I'm, it. I'm going to read that. Um. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that has set before you life and death, choice, blessing and curse, choice, therefore choose life, choice, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of day, days, that you may draw in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. 
choices. You know, it's, it's like a rap song. Choices. You know, I, I you know, I ha I happen to have fifteen underlined as well. Ah, uh -huh. fifteen. Uh, okay, fifteen. Which okay. Yes, yeah, before you. Actually. Yes. See, I have set before you today life and good and death and evil. Yeah. These are choices that you make as a servant of the Lord. Yeah. Every day. Every day. Every day. Every, every, day. Day. every day, every day he writes a book. Every day. <laughs> I, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> so no, I hey, listen. Listen, it, it, it's, 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 it, I'm going to tell you, man, this is interesting because I tell you, I, I can see both sides. I, I do. I see yeah, both I do, sides. Brother. The strength, you, the strength of the scriptures about free will. Yeah. About but men, you men have to just choices. continue. You have to just continue to search the scriptures and, and let the scriptures um speak to you and let God's word you know, be revealed, really. That's why we should pray all the time. We got to be careful. Yeah, we definitely got to be careful because you can see how men from the past, yeah. Augustine, you know, uh, Luther, you you name it, <laughs> um, how... And listen, we, us... we, we, these are men who are finding their ways with it. I mean, I can't speak for Augustus. I can't speak for him. Augustine, but I, I can I can speak for 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 John Calvin and, and and for and for Luther who were you know they were moving away from something they've known all their lives and building something new and they sort of like you know it's almost like you're building a building and you need bricks and you take the bricks that are already in place and to build the place that you're building, you know, not thinking that these 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 bricks are not they're not solid, they're false. And you're building up and your foundation is just torn apart just hundreds of years later because it's stand, it's not standing on anything solid. So let's move on to uh Luke chapter 13, verse 24. <laughs> Crazy. You want to read that, Mario? Was it verse 34 you said? 24. 24? Yeah, uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 24. I got it. Okay, it says, Strive. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once no. the master, well, do you want me to continue? Yeah, go ahead. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. That, in know, that place, right there, yeah. Right and, 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 and again, it's, 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 a, it's a persevering, right? It's, it's not about being elite. It's not about God's choosing because he's, he's chosen all of us to make a decision of free will to come to him, right? And I'm talking to those who are out there who are going to see this video and going to say for themselves, well, you know, uh, uh, I don't know how to, I don't know how to approach it. It, it. It's a free will. You're able to come to him, confess your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Find a church out there who believes in the Bible. Bible believe in church. And, and, and get yourself there. Uh, and, and 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 strive to to seek after the things of God, and that's the most important thing in life. Not anything else. Not what you have. Not what you have on your back. Not not your computers. Not your games. Not nothing. Not your vacations. It means absolutely nothing if you don't take the vacation of a lifetime, of eternity in heaven. 
means absolutely nothing. So let's move on. And I'll be the last scripture we read because it's getting late. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late. The heavenly lights are falling. Jeremiah, no, you know what? Isaiah 48, chapter 48, 17. Isaiah 48, verse 17. Uh, 17, you said? Yeah, 48, 17. Who's doing it? Who's doing it? <laughs> <sighs> Does say the Lord? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's also the Lord. Yeah. Thus said the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your offspring would have been like the sand and your descendants like the grains of their names would never be cut off or destroyed before me. Go out of Babylon, flee the Citadel. How do you say that one? Chaldea. Chaldea declares this with the shout of joy and proclaim it, send it out to the end of the earth, say the Lord have redeemed his servant Jacob. They had not thirst they when he led them through the desert. He made water flow from them from from the rock. He split the rock and the river and the water gushed out. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Okay. So, again, if you trust in the Lord and you obey the Lord, and obey is not contingent on God, obey is contingent on your free will. Here we go again. It's a, it's a narrative that goes on from the very beginning, right? From the fall of man to Cain to all the patriarchs to those who who go against their patriarchs, or to those who go in alliance with patriarchs, it's always about free will, it's about choices. It's not about predestination, right? You know, we only know what God predestines to his prophets and he speaks. We don't know when it actually happens. Well, I mean, obviously we know when it, when it transpires in history. What I'm saying is that it's about free will. Uh, Calvinists, Calvinism has a problem. The history of Calvinism goes way back to even the beginnings of the gospel. So now, yeah, but the, the, the thing is, is that I, I do think that predestination exists. People forget that God can see into the future. That's the problem. Remember, just because God sees the end from the beginning, I'm it not, doesn't I'm take away from our ability. I'm not questioning the predestination of God. I'm yeah. I I I am I'm not for the predestination in in his doctrine. You you can't say that man has not no choice because it's entwined with the free will of man. Predestination talks about things are gonna happen no matter what, and you can't stop it from happening because you have no free will. That's utter nonsense and is yeah, absolutely in other, words, yeah, in other words, just because God sees the end from the beginning, it doesn't take away from man's responsibility. Absolutely. You have, a, you have an obligation as, as, as a human being. Uh, we either accept Christ or receive Christ. Uh, if you don't accept Christ, that means you, 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 you made a choice. You made a choice. It's a free will choice. 
or to accept Christ or not. So with that, guys, um, I'm going. I'm going to pray, and we're going to uh, end this meeting. Father, in the name of your Son Jesus, Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together, Lord God. I pray for the other brothers who were not able to make it, Lord God. Um, I ask you to give them uh, traveling mercies, Lord. Father, I ask you, God, to bind every spirit and every demon that will try to trespass, try to hinder this group and the message which is brought forth, Lord God. We thank you for the opportunity to come together with you in your spirit, Lord God, that we learn, and not just for knowledge, but to fill us with an understanding of what transpired before uh, we were even Christians, Lord. And so we thank you, Lord. We ask you to bless each and every member of, of this body that is here today, Lord. And I pray you that, Lord, that all those who are here tonight, that you will bless their sleep, give them tranquility, bless them, keep them in the blessed name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. I'm going to work on this video oh, right now. Deacon Tony, you, uh, did you come up with a date yet for us to get together or? Uh, no, yeah. we, we, me and Frankie are working that out. Okay. All right. Because, you, I, you know, I'm not even sure about my schedule because I may or may not get a job.